Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. As our colleague just shared, the topic today is decoding image-based sexual violence. So we're coming from the nonprofit space, which I know makes us a, a little bit of an outlier here. Uh, so you will not be hearing a ton of technical jargon, but what you will be taking is a journey to understanding what does this term image-based sexual violence actually mean? What are some of the other terminologies and typologies that you might have heard or might be aligned? So I'm Andrea Powell. I am the director for the Reclaim Coalition, which is a program that is powered by a nonprofit called Panorama Global. Panorama Global's goal is to uplift bold and audacious ideas. I can think of nothing more bold and audacious than tackling image-based sexual violence, which is the new form of gender-based violence that is now online, but has real offline harms. So terms that you might've heard are revenge porn, sextortion, deep fakes. I know you've heard that because I've heard it all over the conference. Um, but how does, that, how does that play out in the, the lives of those who've experienced it? If one in 12 US citizens say they've experienced some form of image-based violence, if this impacts LGBTQ community members seven times more than their non-LGBTQ partners, if it disproportionately impacts the AI space to the point that 96% of AI-generated content is some form of gender-based violence, then it's impacted almost everyone in this space, be it yourself, be it someone you know, be it someone in your community. Our goal at the Reclaim Coalition is to uplift not only lived experience experts, which is centered and at the core of what we do day in and day out, but also our global stakeholders who are helplines, hotlines, direct service providers. And more recently, we're looking for partners in the technology space who can join us in collaboration to make sure that not only do we support survivors and things like image removal, which is critical and important, but also in preventing this form of harm. Being online should not mean that inevitably, particularly as a woman or a girl, that you're going to experience this type of harm. We should not get to a point in which children think that that's true. And yet in a recent Reclaim Coalition partner study, uh, the partner's called Thorn, uh, you can look up their work, 40% of children think that when they share an intimate image online, it also belongs to the person they shared it with. Now, how does that impact the long-term psychology of how this issue plays out? In the United States alone, there are 48 states that have passed some form of law around this particular crime. But all but two base that on this one singular thing. The victim has to prove that there was an intent to harm. There's no other form of sexual violence in which the victim has to say, well, when this person was sexually assaulting me, they meant to cause me harm. Think about if you have a car. I don't, but you might. You're driving your car and someone jumps you and takes your car and drives off with it. You don't go to the police and say, you know, as I thought about them driving off, I wondered if they wanted to harm me. I wonder if they wanted to steal my car. It's just a given because we understand the nature of the crime. But what's happening here with image-based sexual violence is that we're at the emerging tipping point, just as in many other tech spaces, of understanding how this impacts children and how this impacts adults and how we can come together with solutions. At the Reclaim Coalition, we have three main goals. One is to uplift and build knowledge, which is why we're here, to build partnerships, to understand how we can act as a global community to combat this issue, and also do so in such a way that prevents young people from also becoming perpetrators of this crime. Second, we want to make sure that global helpline and hotlines are able to respond efficiently, which means having the right technology, the right community partners, and knowledge from those with lived experience and what they need. And then finally, we want to look at accountability, both on the criminal justice side and civil remedies, which I know means different things in different countries, but also from tech accountability. So it's not just about taking the image down, but could we, for example, Come up with solutions to detect grooming techniques of abusers before the images are created. Could we better understand how to authenticate deep fakes in such a way that when someone's viewing that content that they understand that they're participating in a sex crime? I'm going to close my, my little tirade here uh, for now and pass on to my lived experience experts, but I wanna close in saying that right now, 
survivors around the world, including my colleagues here, their experience was that when this happened to them, be it through a deep fake, revenge porn, an intimate partner, a total stranger who hacked their phone, however it happened, they are largely left to create their own digital rape kit, collecting the URLs, collecting the platforms, and then they're effectively told by law enforcement and tech partners and others across the space, clean up your own crime scene. And that's why we're here today, is we think that we can do considerably better for survivors and also for young people who we hope this never happens to. I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Christina Wayana, who is a student, uh, a mental health professional, an advocate, someone with lived experience, and a very dear colleague of mine who is here from Canada. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming in today and listening to us. Um, I'm not a professional speaker. I am rarely in the public eye, so I, uh, yeah, forgive me if um, I'm not as professional as some of the other speakers today. Uh, so, yeah, I am a master's student. I'm a Canadian. I'm a master's student of counseling psychology. Um, so, currently, I'm a counselor. Uh, not quite a therapist, but I appreciate the uh, note on there. So a little bit about my story. So my story, uh, I'm a survivor of image-based sexual abuse. Um, my story is uh, a little bit different because it overlaps image-based sexual abuse with some of the more easily reprehensible uh, types of cybercrime like fraud and sex, digital sex trafficking. Um, the, one of the perpetrators uh, who uploaded my intimate content uh, was actually on the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitives list. Um, and the people involved were uh, given lengthy sentences uh, for their crimes. Um, so in my case, there was a, a sense of justice uh, that many survivors don't, uh, don't have. Um, but even with that being said, there's still uh, ongoing issues, even if you determine that something has been done or created illegally, um, and there are repercussions, and there's it, the, the digital footprint of those crimes is, is ongoing, it's forever. And it's something that uh, I'm still, still constantly dealing with. Um, so my, my hope for today is that um, we can, as a, as a society, start talking about image-based sexual abuse as not just an interpersonal, um, uh, interpersonal issue, but actually a symptom of larger criminality, um, larger criminal networks. And um, yeah, that's one of my goals for today. Thank you, Christina. So we're going to move on uh, to hear from Matthew. And then just as a preview, uh, following that, we have a colleague named Breeze Louis, uh, who started an app called Electo AI. And I will let her tell her story, but she will be doing so via video due to somewhat ironically a technical issue uh, in uh, her passport. <laughs> so. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Herrick, and I want to kind of walk you through sort of a digital horror story um, something that is very tech-based, but also very embedded within our criminal justice system. And the two really play into each other in how we both have accountability for perpetrators, but also major tech platforms, and how survivors of image-based sexual violence um, seek justice in every shape and form. So I'm going to give you a quick backstory on why I'm here and why I'm talking to you right now. Back in 2017, I was uh, involved with an individual. Uh, the relationship ended. After the relationship ended, this individual began impersonating me on all different types of social media platforms. He began heavily stalking me, um, and he started to weaponize all technology against me. He mainly devoted his time to weaponizing dating apps. So he would utilize my personal images, whether it be a headshot or a photograph in a park or a sexually explicit image, and he would create these profiles on these platforms under the impression that I was seeking this stuff out. So he would put in the profiles my actual height, my actual age. He obviously had a lot of personal information about me. 
and then he would communicate with people through apps. Specifically, he used the app Grindr, which I think a lot of people know about. Um, he would utilize these impersonations to send real life encounters both to my house and to my job. Sometimes up to 23 times a day, people would show up. In the profiles, he would state that I was into rape fantasies, that if I said no, it means push harder, it's all part of the game. He would say I was HIV positive. He would say that I had drugs to show up to buy them from me, to get, give them to me. He would incite racial violence on the platforms, saying I was a white supremacist, and use racial slurs, and then offer my home address and my work address. Over a course of about a year, over 1,200 people had showed up to my house. During this time period, the app Grinder was notified of what was happening on their platform over 50 times. Grinder ignored it. The district attorney of New York City got involved and opened a criminal investigation. During their investigation, they had subpoenaed the company 10, 15 times asking for the data. The company did not even acknowledge the ADA's uh, subpoenas. During that time, I was introduced to a civil attorney who was trying to deter the extreme abuse that was happening on the platforms. So she had asked me if I wanted to pursue possibly a civil litigation against this tech, tech platform. During that time, I didn't know. Somebody said they were gonna help me. The abuse was happening daily. It was horrific. It was affecting not only my mental and emotional health, but my daily life. I was about to lose my job. Um, I literally had nowhere to turn. I would wake up in the morning at 6 a.m. to walk my dog. There'd be somebody waiting for me. I'd go to bed at night and I'd walk outside to have a cigarette. There'd be somebody waiting for me. Every corner I turned on, there was somebody waiting for me who thought they knew me and thought they were taking something from me. As we moved forward, we ended up following civil litigation against Grindr. We first sent them a cease and desist letter. They ignored it. We got an emergency Supreme Court justice injunction or Supreme Court injunction against them. They ignored it. So we proceeded with the lawsuit. It, went to, it was remanded back to federal courts in the states. Um, and it was the first time they actually acknowledged I existed. We had filed over 50 complaints with the company through the dating app, asking for the photos and the profiles to be taken down. They ignored that. It wasn't until that court date that they showed up. And in the United States, we have a law called Section 230. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with it, but it basically gives online providers complete immunity from any liability that happens on their platform. They use that as their defense. They said, we don't care, we can't be held liable, we will not intervene, it's not our problem. They denied the basic technologies that exist because multiple other dating platforms had built this into their product of identifying IP addresses and banning the user from using their product. So that in order for them, as you guys all know, to use that application again, they would have to get a new phone. Now we know that at the end of the day when somebody's hell bent on terrorizing and ruining someone's life, they will find a way. But what that would have astronaut, that small, small technical thing would have done, would have astronomically slowed down the abuse I was experiencing on a daily. When they denied the district attorney's access to the data, to the profiles, all of that stuff would have astronomically pushed my case forward. It went on for an entire year before they could get a guilty verdict against this guy through an indictment. He had 17 charges, seven felonies, 10 misdemeanors, went, went away to prison for eight years, was promised four, served two and a half. It was during the pandemic. In regards to the civil litigation, we lost our uh, first round, as I like to call it, because we went for multiple. Um, we lost because of the implications of Section 230, we publisher uh, versus provider, and we um, ended up taking it all the way to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and oral arguments. The judges on that panel did not understand 
how anything works from a technological standpoint. I mean, even before we got up there, it was terrifying to know that, you know, the whatever three, you know, 75 year old white men who don't even know what an iCloud is was deciding the fate, my fate on a geolocation application that was actually patented by Grindr. They had created it, but didn't know how to control it. So the weaponization of their product was doomed from the beginning. All the basic technologies they wanted to build in there, they didn't do because they knew they could hide behind this law. So we have to look at the moral and ethical values of companies, tech companies, as they begin to design their products and seeing how that can tremendously affect people in the future. What we see in tech, and I don't mean to shit on everyone, we see an opportunity to make a lot of money. But what we actually forget, that there's a human experience involved. And without protecting your users, and I'm talking about more so than like, Grindr ignored its own terms and services, something they created for that community and violated their own terms and service by letting these profiles live on the platform. Multiple pro profiles at the same time living on this platform. We went to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. The judges said, I don't even know what an iCloud is in the case before me. This was an FBI case of a man who was serving a life sentence. Don't we think that the people that control our lives and like what our outcome will be in the future should know all of this stuff? Well, they didn't. So they denied my right to access for justice because of Section 230. Then me and my lawyers took it to the Supreme Court. We were also denied there. So we lost. There was no access to justice for the survivor of this crime. It was a very public situation. It was in the news. They sensationalized my story. They used me and threw me out. But now what we're seeing is five years later, people having real conversations about why Section 230 in the States is so important and why it's so important for reform. Not only from a federal level of, you know, uh, for abusers to be handed down punishment for the crimes they commit, utilizing the weaponization of tech and tech-based violence, but also for tech companies to actually have accountability within the grand scheme of things, knowing that if egregious behavior is having, happening on their platform, they are actually doing everything they can to intervene, to cooperate with law enforcement, and to find a solution. The solution shouldn't be throwing your hands up and saying, not my problem, let the police do it. And as the world begins to explode, I mean, we are a technologically driven society. Our phones are in our hands and everything we need is right there. What's gonna happen in the next five years? So it is so, so important to me from the ground up that design of product be at the forefront of our thoughts when we are doing something that creates real life interactions between individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew and Christina again. Um, as you can see, much of this is not inevitable. As I said before, it's preventable and there can be collaboration, which is of course why we're here at this convening and so grateful to have been invited at so many tech conferences that I've been to. Well, I'm not gonna say so many, at the limited number of tech conferences I've been to in the last year. I haven't found a space where talking about image-based sexual violence across the spectrum of adolescents, children, and adults is really present in a meaningful way. And so I think we're at a, not to overplay it, but a bit of a groundbreaking moment. Um, and so often you see that there's these silos, law enforcement, I know there's some running around, um, that there's you know the, the more social services side, me, then there's, you know, lived experience experts, all of us. There's also, you know, the tech side of things. And I think that the sweet spot of social change, of shifting the narrative is possible when we think about solutions in a collaborative way. Um, I wanted to introduce someone and I have consent to share a, a limited amount of her background before we show this video, just so there's some context and it doesn't scare you uh, or surprise you. 
But uh, another colleague of mine, as I said, who couldn't join is named Breeze Louis. Breeze Louis grew up in China, uh, was admitted to UC Berkeley in San Francisco, and by the end of her senior year, become class president. She was the first uh, foreign national class president of UC Berkeley, full stop. She studied peace and conflict. Um, a male colleague of hers started to date her, and when she ended the relationship, he later uploaded intimate images that he had videoed and photographed of her during their relationship onto websites like Pornhub, onto other websites that are more insidious and quiet, ones that are hard to find through Reddit forums, through Tumblr. She didn't find out for over two years. At this time, she'd become a venture capitalist working in the tech community. Life was going great. Then a friend called and said, my roommate found you on Pornhub. And she's like, a porn what? That can't be true. When she saw the images, she wanted to take her life. But thank goodness she didn't because over 40 cases that we're aware of of teenagers do. Uh, it causes really real psychological harm. But instead of going into the shell where her perpetrator wanted her to go and wanted her to fail, Breeze took every penny of her personal resources and she's working right now to create an app called Electo AI. I am not gonna talk AI to you, <laughs> because you all probably very well know better than me how to communicate that. And I'm not here to verify necessarily the tech background of what Electo AI can do. But what I can say is this, having a survivor taking the lead in this space to use AI to create verified hashing and identity to have people upload their face and then be notified if there's possible intimate images of them online and then to decide, leave them up, take them down because there are individuals on certain platforms, maybe OnlyFans or Instagram, who have intimate images up there that they want up there. But this is all about consent, and Electo AI, with Breeze's brilliant mind, um, and as one of our partners, is trying to shift the landscape so that online intimacy is about consent and not about harm and abuse. And so with that, we're going to hope that we get to watch Breeze's uh, video. It looks, yes, they're smiling at me, so that means yes. Three years ago, I found out someone I once dated filmed me without my consent and posted the video on Pornhub. I was humiliated in the worst possible way in front of the whole world. The shame destroyed me, and I came close to taking my own life. What happened to me is the most devastating form of online image abuse. According to a research conducted across three countries, at least 600 million people suffer from the same form of abuse, and one third of them have considered suicide. With the rise of generative AI and social media, we are facing a massive issue. This is the famous deepfake video that went viral on TikTok last year. We have officially opened the Pandora's box with this technology. Eight months ago, the mayors of Berlin, Madrid, and Vienna were duped into holding video calls with someone impersonating the mayor of Kiev using deepfake. These politicians spoke with the impersonator for 15 minutes without suspecting his identity. The future is already here, and it is terrifying. Deepfake is only the tip of the iceberg. Authentic pictures are actually abused all the time, our viewpoints can be easily manipulated or even weaponized. If I only show you the left part of this picture, you might think of conflict, killing, and abuse. If I only show you the right part, you might think of peace, kindness, and human rights. When an image is interpreted out of context, it can create a dangerous chain reaction. Speculation can quickly turn into gossip, which can lead to conflict and ultimately result in chaos. When your face is stolen, your life is also stolen from you. While the internet has no borders, jurisdiction does have its borders. The lack of accountability for perpetrators of such abuse made it difficult to tackle. But the fundamental problem is we are not in control of our own image online. July 13th, 2022. This girl shared a photo on social media. In the picture, she was sharing her grad school acceptance letter with her hospitalized grandfather. Tragically, 
an education company stole her photo and fabricated a fake story titled "An Old Man Receives His Graduate School Offer with His Young Wife at His Bedside." The fake story went viral, and the girl was cyberbullied for her pink hair and falsely labeled as a nightclub girl. After battling cyberbullying for six months, she took her own life about two months ago. This vibrant young woman graduated top of her class. She had a bright future ahead of her, but now everything ended. We live in a world where fake news travels six times faster online than truthful news, and innocent people had to die to escape from cyberbullying. We live in a world where victims of online image abuse suffer in silence while the perpetrators get away freely. We live in a world where big tech companies have more control over our data than we do. Meta was fined five billion dollar by the federal government for privacy violations, but they're still unable to fix the problem. So why is it so difficult to tackle? Because there is one crucial missing piece: consent. I believe individuals' consent is the silver bullet to solve the online image abuse problem. Because we are the only ones who could verify authenticity of our own image, but we can't take action unless we have sovereign control over our own data. Electo AI serves as the broken link that connects individuals and platforms together. Here is how it works: We use facial recognition technology to perform reverse image search and find a match across the database. This is the tool. That tells you where your image appears across the internet. When something seems wrong, we help you report it and process the takedown notices across different platforms. As a survivor of this, I value privacy more than anything. So we added a security gate that verifies users' identities and prevents this tool from being abused by stalkers. Our two-layer security system guarantees your search results are visible to your eyes only. That makes us the only facial recognition tool on the market that does not compromise between accessibility and security. We have built a one-stop solution to fight online image abuse. With this app, we give you the right to control your own data and your own image. We also offer mental health and legal support at your fingertips. More importantly, we offer a community. Where people can come together to share their stories and support each other. If we consider each individual as a nation state, then our privacy and online image should be defended as our national sovereignty. Electo AI as a detection tool serves as your first line of defense. We have created a new system called Software as a Deterrence. Long enough. That we suffered from online image abuse. I built this company with the hope that all of us and our future generations would one day take it for granted that no one would ever die from the violence that happened online. You for coming back over here and not make me feel awkward.、Uh, so that is Electo AI.、Uh, I'm sorry that Breeze couldn't be with us today, but I, what I what I hope is one of your takeaways is that lived experience is a critical sector as we're looking to address the issue of image-based sexual violence. I mentioned earlier that we talk about different terminology like deep fakes. One of our other colleagues, Noel Martin, is an Australian attorney, human rights advocate, and survivor. Is furious at the term deepfake. Why? Because it causes real harm. And so, what might look like a joke, like the young—I don't know how many of you've heard of the case of some young boys in Spain who made deepfakes of their young female classmates, some as young as 11 years old.、Um, but to them, it might have been a joke. But to those young girls, there's nothing fake about it. It's their real identities and it's their real digital lives. As one of our colleagues said earlier, we're all using our phones. We're all Connected to a digital space, when that's manipulated against you, the message it sends to so many young people, particularly girls who have aspirations, be it as influencers, politicians, activists, 
the implications are don't be online. It's a new version of digital slut shaming, basically. And what we're also seeing, and I'm not here today to point any fingers at any big tech companies, but I can't avoid using their name in this example, but there are over 3,000 websites on Google alone that are specifically dedicated to online image-based sexual violence. I have a question for you, and you can try this trick at home if you like. So if you go onto Google and you search how to strangle my kitten, it sends you back these messages that effectively say, don't do that. Um, you know, don't hurt the kitty cat. Uh, ethical euthanasia, da 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 If you Google how to make a deep fake of my ex-girlfriend, not only does it give you a how-to guide, but multiple free apps, and then points you to a website called Mr. Deep Fakes. And it's not just celebrities. It's not just Jennifer Lawrence. It's not just Billie Eilish. It's housewives. It's paralegals in Tennessee. It is college students in Portugal and it causes incredible harm. And so my question is, and perhaps you might find it reductive, why are cats more important than women and girls in this context? If that technology exists, if we can find ways to better detect those types of searches and suppress that type of information or de-index, if you will, and I, I don't know the technology behind it, but it sounds good to me, um, why are we not doing it? What would be the, how would we motivate? And I believe the answer to that resoundingly is through sharing lived experiences and uplifting supports and services. Uh, we have a number of colleagues here who are working on helplines and hotlines. Uh, those helpline and hotlines also need good technology. They need stakeholders like Breeze and Electo AI. They need other forms and resources to track this information to prevent re-victimization and to ensure that survivors know that their services, because when a victim comes forward and they're sharing their story in law enforcement or a tech company, which in many ways is kind of acting in a, in a technical law enforcement capacity, will we or will we not take, take down the image? It really sends a very strong message to whether or not they're going to pursue justice. And it also sends a strong message to those who might initiate or join in on the crime. I'm about to open a bit of a can of worms, but during the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial, there are over a million tweets alone that used AI to manipulate imagery of Amber. And I put them in three camps. One was Amber's fat. That's mean, that's cyberbullying. Then there's the deep fakes of Amber being assaulted. Um, that's also illegal, but nonetheless, then there were also ones of Amber's little girl being gang raped. So these over a million tweets alone, what we wanna see is a shift from people participating in the abuse, resharing the abuse, using the content, to over a million people reporting the abuse. And so tech companies not only have a technological opportunity, but also an opportunity to educate their users. An example of that would be the, the uh, lifestyle company Bumble. Bumble has a new form of technology that enables users to blur out what is effectively called dick pics. Sorry about that. Um, but that technology could be reversed to also do things like what Electo's trying to do. I'm gonna close um, as we're leading toward the end with a, one simple question for our other panelists. And sorry, Breeze can't join in on this. But Christina, uh, you have shared that you're an emerging therapist or an actual therapist, depending on who you ask. Um, I know that you have deep-rooted motivation and inspiration, not only from your lived experience, but otherwise. What, what would you say to tech companies on how they can support lived experience experts in that healing journey? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I think that my motivation for being here and the main takeaway I wanna have for everybody who's listening is that this stuff is happening it's, it's happening with, you have kids, you have nieces, nephews, um, your girlfriends. It, it doesn't matter if you're a child or an adult, it can happen. Um, you can be the target of this. And just have these conversations, especially with your kids. Tell them like, that it is, it is illegal um, in Canada. There's uh, section 162, I believe, covers uh, non-consensual non distribution of an intimate image, um, voyeurism, so recording someone without their knowledge. Um, and also sharing, it's also a crime to share materials, uh, share or distribute materials that have been made um, through voyeurism. So 
if your friend sends you a link that's a hidden camera thing and then you distribute it, well, you're also um, committing a crime. So talk to your kids about that, especially with sextortion. Um, we talked about how this is a, 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 it's a, a, a gendered uh, issue. Um, but also with uh, men, men aren't exempt from this. 91% uh, of sextortion victims for youth are male. Um, and so talk to your, your sons about this too, because there's a lot of shame around it, and we just don't want to have any more deaths, um, any more, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, just, just to ignite that conversation, I think, is my main takeaway for, uh, for today. Thank you, Christina. And Matthew, more than just your inspiration, what, what do you hope for future cases like yours, if there are any, will happen? And how can, how can tech companies participate in a meaningful way to prevent the type of injustice you've experienced from happening? Um, I think I sort of touched on it earlier. I think it's implement, implementing these basic technologies when building out your product. Um, in comparison uh, to Grindr, there was another app called Scruff and they had built, they were much, much smaller company worth way less money than this multi-billion dollar company. And from the ground up, they had built all of this in. They've ha had people that they had pinpointed that work within the company that would work directly with law enforcement um, so that they could move the criminal side because that's the most important at the end of the day. I mean, like tech, it starts with the perpetrator, right? The abuser. And then tech now has been this like, facilitator and all of it that exasperates a, a bad situation into sometimes a life-threatening situation. So I think what tech can do is, is really in these egregious examples that I'm giving you today, it's not isolated incidents. We see it all the time, um, especially within Reclaim. And, and I work with my old law firm um, in different capacities that represented me. And these cases are popping up all the time and they're popping up on the same apps. And I, I'm really targeting dating apps because that's really where a lot of the violence starts, like interpersonal violence and then the in real life type of violence. So. I, I really just believe that there's, there's this duty of tech companies to step outside and immediately work with law enforcement, especially when subpoenas are involved. Um, if you're creating a way for me to report something, but you're sending me back an automated message, what is that really doing? All you're doing is giving me a paper trail that you did nothing. Um, and then in the States, obviously, if you take it to the courts, they don't give a shit either because <laughs> they won't do anything because of Section 230. But I think from the, it really begins with the development of the product and foreseeing what type of ways can my product be weaponized in the future and how can I prevent this from happening and how can we create different systems of response that will not only work with victims but also work with law enforcement so that the next person doesn't have a year of struggling in and out of court systems that this is resolved in a more timely manner, a more effective manner. Thank you, Matthew. So we're getting close to the end and I feel like we've thrown a lot of information at all of you. Thank you for staying. And I hope this wasn't overwhelming for any of you who might have lived experience yourself. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to walk up uh, and ask directly afterwards or you, you can ask now. I think we have about five minutes remaining. And if you want to reach us afterwards, I believe Christina and I are reachable on the app and Matthew's ghosted the app. Um, so, uh, but you can find him otherwise. <laughs> or the app ghosted you, it's, it's to be determined. <laughs> but regardless, we really do appreciate all of you, um, and we're very sincere in that we're looking for allies across a spectrum of Tech for Good spaces, and we believe that sweet spot of civil society lived experience adv advocates as well as Tech for Good stakeholders, be they in big tech or other tech uh, or startups or tech aligned. We really think this is a solvable issue, but we need to solve it now before our children think it's inevitable. Thank you.